you you know already now how to read chinese okay so beyond formidable obstacles a brighter future shines and it's so true uh, with where we are okay so today's chip story is about china whenever i do the research right i really get inside that country and try to figure out whole bunch of stuff and uh, this was like one of the very surprising experience for me because i had not forced myself i've never visited china unfortunately i visited taiwan many times i've stayed there for a long time so the reason i'm showing you china is because the map of china everybody knows where india is right if you look at the those tiny dots on the right bottom corner you see taipei that's taiwan that's the country which is right now holding the entire uh, world right tsmc such a tiny country and then um, just a little bit to the left you see small inscription saying hong kong okay just keep keep pay attention to that because i want you to have a perception of size so it doesn't matter the size of the country uh, it's it's a people who are living inside the country which are more important is all i'm trying to say china a little bit of history of china is important because otherwise you will not appreciate uh, the communist seized power in 1949 in 1965 though they had their first integrated circuit Uh, 1958 59 was uh, jack kelby and uh, you know so about 5 6 years later they had their first integrated circuit remember that uh, the chairman mao zedong okay so he was the a very interesting person we are always sitting on a comparator i like to com uh, compare our behavior to circuits right we are always sitting on a comparator you are quick judge of good or bad huh? but you have to imagine what he was going through at that time in china he came from a worker class family his uh, politics was all proletarian for politics what that means is people who are working in the farm okay those uh, you know he was for them so all his policies were revolved around that so he had a little bit of extreme view towards things because if you are inside your own home uh, let's say in this class right um, um, 90% of the people are farmers right then we are going to think like farmers eventually and then people who are 10% who are a little bit different they will get suppressed okay as long as you don't go outside the classroom as long as you are confined in the classroom that's what will happen that's what happened with china because they were all uh, they were protectionist the, inside the country and you see the same behavior even right now you have no clue what what is going on inside it's a good thing and a bad thing too okay all right um, so um, his thing was that oh everybody right all Uh, all of you even though 80 90% of you are from farmer family all of you the last 10 also have to work in the field and you have to earn your living in the field doesn't matter um, how smart you are or whatever that was his equality business right and uh, they had self imposed embargo hmm, with the rest of the world and there was a huge focus on self reliance so everything is all us so within china we will do we will cut out anything from outside anything that comes from outside is a agent of counter revolution hmm? that's what they were believing iron and steel industries what they think they thought that oh this is it that's a, that's what we need to have a lead role uh, there were 10 chinese 10% right whatever we are talking about these uh, chinese scientists they were they were super smart um smartness doesn't come uh, because you are from a region smartness is a fact which is just statistics okay if you take a large sample you will find 10% people who are super smart okay so that doesn't mean that you are from china us or anything like that the point i'm trying to make is that statistically they had a very strong technically qualified people however they just resented it and you know what happened right you know uh, what happened with morris chang he left china and everybody was leaving the place because uh, you know nobody wanted to go and work in the farm, uh, farm right and you know the thing was that what you could eat in the farm was also controlled you can only eat boiled cabbage things like that so you could die literally because no medicine so this was the state uh, of china uh, before 1990 at the same time uh, uh, you remember i showed you hong kong taiwan and hong kong hong kong is such a tiny piece uh, the situation in hong kong was very different okay so hong kong was a chinese territory controlled by british so they were in full to mode huh? semiconductor assembly that's it that's what they were doing uh, because they had a little bit of autonomy compared to the mainland so there is always a mainland and then these all uh, things right life was good for them all the people there huh? and uh, all the foreign companies were coming to hong kong and the labor force actually was coming from china to hong kong to do the work because rather than working in the farm and not making any money at least here i'll make few cents right uh, for what do i have to do i have to just put things together i get decent food life was good about 1975 
Uh, you remember John Bardeen, uh, inventor of the transistor, right? So he is the only person who got two Nobel Prizes. First is for the transistor with Shockley and Bertain. And then the second one was for superconductivity. I mean, amazing, right? This is like his second Nobel after getting the second Nobel in 72. He visited China because uh, at that time there was like, huh, the US universities need to proliferate to other universities all over the world, globally. Hmm? So he wanted to kind of uh, see what can we do type of thing. So he had some very interesting thoughts about his, about his visits. Um, so he uh, basically, they were trying to do like a technology friendship. So they were, uh, so I mean his opinion was that the engineers in China were equally capable, but they were not allowed to claim that glory. If you claim glory, then that's kind of against communist principles, right? Uh, they were kind of denying themselves of progress. About 1976, one year, I mean, no connection between the two. Chairman Mao was not well uh, before, passed away in 1976. The new person, Deng Xiaoping, hmm, he became uh, the chairman, new chairman of China. And he was a um, founder of modernization. So he said, okay, that's it. You know, new uh, time's up. Now let's move uh, forward. Hmm? So um, many times uh, in the news media, people compare uh, our own Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, to him. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, he had such an impact on China that single-handedly he, uh, he made radical changes in China compared to where they were. The rate of change, the derivative of change is, uh, it's tremendous, right? On one side, you have people in the farm dying, uh, barely making ends to meet, and suddenly there is a total change in the country's thinking. Uh, Chairman uh, Deng Xiaoping, okay? So science and technology became the focal point. You can see a lot of similarities, right? First thing is you import. The first uh, principle was to import everything from outside. The second principle was you make it in China. You make the same thing in China, whatever you are importing. And the third thing was export. Huh? So you bring in, you learn how to make it, make it in China, use our enormous labor force, and then you export out of China. Unfortunately, it's something like research, like pure research, cannot be controlled by government order. Okay, so they really tried hard. They had all, they were all gung ho. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll march to this, but. They struggled. Ideas were right, the thinking was right, uh, but uh, you know when it comes to high technology, it's not something you can you can push people to you know suddenly make uh, you know integrated circuit right uh, a production worthy integrated circuit. So the next person I call him the unsung hero, yet another unsung hero of the chip story right is Richard Chang. Now remember Maurice Chang, Richard Chang, they were not related, okay, but yet another Chang, and how much impact he created. His uh, Chinese name is Zhang Ruzheng, okay. He was born in Nanjing, China, 48, 1948. So uh, younger than uh, Maurice Chang. There also, within a year, his family was also like a peasant family. Uh, I think if I remember steel workers, they were working in a steel mill or something. And then um, just to survive, they escaped China. Hmm? And they went to Taiwan. So when they went to Taiwan, uh, he grew up in Taiwan, literally. So again, you know, remember the key part I'm trying to tell you. Uh, we remember Maurice Chang, where was he born? Again, mainland China. And then he also escaped. He went to Hong Kong, back and forth, back and forth, and eventually ejected to United States. Where was the first place he went to? MIT. Huh? Remember MIT. Now, in this case, the story was a little bit different. Now, he went to Taiwan. He finished his mechanical engineering at uh, NTU. And after finishing his uh, mechanical engineering, he did his uh, master's, SUNY Buffalo, if I remember correctly. And then he did his PhD at uh, SMU, Southern Methodist University in Texas, which is again in US. And that was in electrical engineering. So after that, what's the next step? Once you finish your education in Texas, what do you do? You join Texas Instruments. There we go. Okay. So he joined Texas Instrument and his first job, who was his boss? Jack Kilby was his boss. Okay, I'm making this story for you interesting because then you will see, you can connect all the dots to where, where the origin of life is, right? Kind of uh, from our point of view. So Jack Kilby at TI was his first boss. I mean, amazing guy. He learned how to operate fabs. 
Now that's that's a skill which is a very rare skill. Why I'm telling you that? Because you can learn how to do A, you can learn how to do B, you can learn how to do C. But to do the entire operation of a fab, a complex fab, uh, this man did it. Okay, and he ran so many fabs in various places. He opened a fab for TI uh, worldwide. Okay, multiple fabs. I think six or seven fabs, if I remember correctly. So then uh, he was a he was a Christian. Okay, and he had this missionary zeal. So his goal was, uh, hey, you know, there should be a semiconductor foundry in China for my people. That was his mission. So he he returned back to China. Uh, even though, you know, all the pain and suffering that was there part of his earlier life, uh, at the end he returned back to China. And then um, he started this company called Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, uh, SMIC. We call it SMIC. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done in 2000, year 2000, remember that. Okay. When was TSMC started? 1985, 15 years before. And so TSMC was already set. It was all going full, full blown, you know, it was ahead of the world. Uh, and he started as SMIC. So before that also China made lots of attempts. Um, but one thing or the other kept failing. Because they tried some things which we sometimes, you know, with us in India, that some politician's son will be involved and, you know, to get the clearances, this and that. A lot of political pieces were going. So, uh, you know, uh, Richard realized that hey, none of this, uh, this is not going to work. So I don't want any favors. I just want to focus on, uh, you know, high quality people, get them. And then I want to focus on our work. Uh, uh, basically, our work has to shine. So 2000, he started SMIC um, and he raised $1.5 billion, okay, billion dollars all by himself huh? from who? Motorola, Toshiba and GS. He raised a capital of $1.5 billion and um, his goal was very simple. Follow the TSMC model for China. Huh? China came, and everybody is trying to do that. We are trying to do the same thing right now, today. Okay. So we are where China was in 2000 in 2025, almost 25. Hmm? So remember that. So this, uh, you should always have the reference in your head, you know, in history where you are, okay? So uh, what was his uh, goal, right? So the key idea, their slogan was very simple. Huh? We will get one good engineer and that good engineer will bring two more engineers. Okay. So they started this total operation of Kahasebi, USA, all over the places, right? Handpick people and bring them back. So all experienced engineers from all over the world, they came back to China. Okay, because they also wanted to do something for their country. They all came back. You know, it was a crucible of local and foreign manpower. And they kind of worked it out very well uh, because local manpower was important. Because they had to learn, they had to uh, get better and better and better, right? So earlier they were doing a lot of uh, assembly type of work. Now suddenly this is a new ball game, right? Here you are running the fab. And uh, you know, Richard knew how to do the fab. He had everything in his head how to do the fab. So uh, he started the fab, SMIC, and then within short time, they were giving TSMC run for their money, literally. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, TSMC at that point was like a gorilla, right? And here is an ant which is competing with a gorilla. Remember that. Hmm? So um, there was a government support. Government said, you know, you got it. You know, we won't touch you. Uh, and, you know, tax holiday, this, whatever you need, we will do it. Uh, but you just have to uh, produce chips. It's not just producing chips, but uh, his mission was, how do I get better? You know, he wanted to run ahead of TSMC. That was the vision with which he was going. He didn't want to follow. Four years they were listed in New York Stock Exchange which is like unbelievable, okay, get funding, become successful, uh, it's very difficult to become, get on a stock exchange, because you have to show money, you have to show that you're making profits, you're survivable, and you're sustainable, and nobody can swamp you out, swat you out, you know, nobody should be able to kill you. They were on New York Stock Exchange 2004, and of course, uh, there was a, you know, this was a competition to TSMC, Samsung, UMC, and Chartered Semiconductor also. So CS in the previous example was Chartered Semiconductor. Chartered Semiconductor was in uh, Singapore. Hmm? So all these other places had already started fabs and they were with Ashirwad of US companies. 
Now this guy didn't want to do that. This guy wanted to do it on his own. Okay, so he did it, and then who benefited in this whole process? U.S. benefited. The cost of the fabrication went down because now suddenly there is uh, SMIC, there is TSMC, and all of them were competing for business. Okay, they all wanted business from all over the world. So suddenly the the cost per square foot hmm, went down. Just like in real estate, the cheap real estate also the cost per square foot went down. So fab cost dropped, and what happened then? Fabless flourished. So this was an exponentially increasing number of fabless companies. Now you suddenly had a choice. Oh, I can just send it to SMIC uh, or PSMC or this place or that place. And whoever gives me the favorable terms, I will fabricate it over there. Okay, that's the story for you today. So this is the China story. Okay, so next week we'll have something more interesting. Thank you.